Good morning. Bowen in the morning here with you on Giant FMWROI. We're joined by Eric Seward with uh, Woodlawn Hospital. Dr. Seward, good morning. Thanks for joining us today. Good morning. Good morning on this Thanksgiving week. Uh, we, we are ready for it. You know, there are a couple things you count down for. Christmas, New Year's, waiting for the ball to drop. And I don't know about you, but my family's a big Thanksgiving. <laughs> we count down till the turkey's done. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think once that... Um weekend is over, I start to count down to the next Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, and there have been times in my past, personally, I don't know if everybody's like this, but where you have two sides of the family and you go eat lunch at one place and go to the dinner at the other place. Now, I can't handle that anymore, but we now sometimes have one on Thursday and then another one on, on Friday or Saturday. And yeah. you know, I'm not, I have not gotten into the Black Friday shopping kick, but... I, I haven't either, and I don't know if there's ever going to be a switch that flips in me that says it's time for Black Friday shopping. Uh, you mentioned the two different uh, meals, lunch and dinner. Our family's pretty evenly split between turkey and ham, so early we'd have the turkey and late we'd have the ham. Hey, that's and, a, or, or you could do the, the, the turkey. Ham Duncan or whatever. There's a mix of there's a I mix of all of them. <laughs> they throw him in there. Yeah, they got the turkey and the duck and the chicken. That'd be an interesting. <laughs> that'd be an interesting bird to see. <laughs> half ham, half turkey. Perfect for Thanksgiving, everyone. Perfect. So again, Dr. Eric Seward joins us from Woodlawn Hospital, and we're talking pregnancy today. What do we need? Yeah. To know? Well, speaking of turkeys, I, I mentioned that I'm, I'm this week. I'm going to be deep frying a turkey, um, which is new for me. And we'll, if I explode something out west of the lake, you guys will know what. The smoke is um but but speaking of baking turkeys um i have my own little turkey baking in the oven um i'm my significant other is um pregnant and congratulations with the baby in early may so with that in mind i thought this would be a great uh topic to to go over we have talked around pregnancy in a, a few different ways um throughout all of our time here in the radio it's come up in a few of the talks before but i thought in some of those things i'll rehash um and then maybe put it together in a slightly different uh, view sure. but uh you know pregnancy is something that's big on a lot of people's minds it's, it's at least half of what i do in the office um when and I, I think as a sort of a basic review, um, the way that it all works, and I won't get too graphic here, but the way that one gets pregnant <laughs> has to do with ovulation, and uh, we usually start the thought process on ovulation at the first day of, of a period. So that's that's sort of ground zero for um, our dating, and when you think about a period, when we talk about a menstrual cycle, we're talking about the first day of the period forward. And what happens during that first couple of weeks is the the lining of the of the uterus sheds off and then it starts to rebuild and it starts to rebuild evenly. Think about a messy bed. You whip the blanket off and you start to make a new fresh bed. Well, that's what we're doing is we're making a fresh bed for a fertilized egg to land in. And somewhere in, in the typical average cycle, somewhere around day 14, um, that throughout that first half, there's a follicle developing with an egg. Um, that egg will ovulate. There's a little bursting of a bubble, and the egg floats down the tube. And if there's a, a, a man to dance with, then ultimately you end up with a, a pregnancy. Um, so a sperm and an egg are usually coming together right around somewhere between day 14 and 17 or so of a normal cycle. Um, then they float down the tube. While they're floating along, those cells are dividing and dividing and dividing, and the first little step is just a ball of cells. Usually that, if you think about it, they go from 1 to 2 to 4 to 8 to 16 to 32 and so forth. Somewhere in that 32-ish cell range, they're just a ball of cells we call a morula, but they start to involute into what we call a blastula, and then by the time they get down to the lining of the uterus, they're what's called a blastocyst. And what that basically means is, Instead of just being cells that are dividing, they are starting to specialize. So, um, a lot of a, a lot of times, um, we hear talk about these undifferentiated cells and what you can do with them. Um, well. In this particular case, they're truly undifferentiated because any of those cells can go on to be 
any bit of an entire human. And, and so it's kind of a fascinating time. These cells are completely um, able to, to take on any identity, if that makes sense. Um, and some of them are going to become placenta cells. Some of them are going to become uh, the amniotic membrane cells. Some of them are going to be a pancreas or an eyeball. And, uh, and there's so many little like subspecialty things that happen in, in making of a person. But somewhere um, after about seven days floating down the tube, five to seven days or so, they land in the lining of the uterus, and then shortly thereafter, they make contact with the maternal blood system, and they spit out pregnancy hormone. That's beta HCG, or what we call human chorionic gonadotropin. And that's the stuff that we're measuring when we do a pregnancy test. So sometime around that missed next period, you are registering um, a faint positive on on any commercial pregnancy test. Uh, There's two pregnancy tests that we sometimes use. Um, The the one that most people are familiar with is the pee on the stick in the bathroom kind. Um, That, that's, and there's a variety of those. Um, And quite frankly, the ones we use in the office are no different than the ones you'd buy at Walmart or or, or CVS or wherever. The, they're all pretty good. They all start to show up around the time of a missed period. By a week into the next uh, cycle, if, if somebody's late a week, usually they're going to be fairly positive. Um, the other kind we use are called quantitative tests, and these are a little bit more valuable for me as a doctor because then they tell me a little more about what's happening. But they they work on a number basis, and so there's there's an amount that uh, that of HCG floating in the system at any given time that you can measure. And HCG starts to be positive around 5. So if it's 5 or below, it's considered negative. If it's above 5, it's considered positive. And it doubles about every 48 hours. So 5 to 10 to 20 and so forth. And um, usually it's somewhere between 20 and 30 that you start to see a faint line on those those home pregnancy tests. Um, by the time it gets to a thousand to two thousand, we can see a little gestational sac forming on an ultrasound. By the time it gets up to between ten and maybe twenty five thousand or so, we can see um, a heartbeat on a, on an ultrasound. And those things correlate uh, with roughly about five to five and a half weeks and six to seven weeks um, accordingly. So you see that gestational sac in that five and a half week range. You see the the fetal heart rate usually in that six to seven week range. And uh, and then it just sort of spirals from there. Now, I'm talking in weeks, and I always go over this with my patients. One of the first things I do, because I always talk in weeks, and their next door neighbor and their aunt and their grandmother at the Thanksgiving table, they're going to be saying, how many months are you? <laughs> and uh, and there's a little bit of algebra involved in that because, um, you know, most months have 31 days. Uh, some have 30. Um, some have 28. This next year we'll even have a 29. So it, it just sort of messes everything up. But if you sort of think about nine weeks, Weeks as being two months. That worked for most most months, and it also works out to this forty week gestation that we you know that we go off of. So a due date is based on forty weeks from a perfect last period, and and so that's sort of the mechanics. That's the background. Now. Uh, when people find out that they're pregnant, they jump up and down, they get excited, and nowadays they put it on Facebook, Instagram, and other, you know, uh, modalities, and they and they um, then they make their appointment to see their doctor. <laughs> and usually they come in and see me anywhere from, uh, depending on how nervous and excited they are, anywhere from you know, six weeks up to 10 weeks. And that's ideal for me. Occasionally people jump the gun and they, they come in immediately, you know, when they find a faint positive. Yeah. Um, some people um, don't know that they're pregnant right away and they may not pick up on some of the subtle cues. But ultimately, um, y- you know, we usually are seeing people in the sort of second half of the first trimester, which we consider the first 12 weeks. Sure. Um, that said, uh, just to kind of run over prenatal care a little bit, and this is where I come in and in my interaction with, with pregnancy and, and patients. Um, it, normally, when I first see somebody, what I like to do is I like to get a set of basic labs and I like to do an ultrasound. The ultrasound is really to confirm a couple of things. One, I want to make sure that we're on the right track. Um, it, there's a, a surprising number of people that come in that um, either are destined to miscarry or are way off on their dates. Yeah. Um, it's, it's 
not at all unusual, probably about half the time that I that I change dates based on that first ultrasound. Um, and sometimes it's wildly different than, I mean, I've gone in to do a six-week ultrasound and found a 22-week baby before. You know, it's just, it's one of those like, whoa, that doesn't look like a six-week baby, you know, and, and my, for me, it's, it's a little bit like catching a, a, you know, a fish and you're like pulling it up and you think you got a bluegill and you pull out a, you know, a northern pike. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 you off guard. It's, it does catch you off guard a little. Um, but in, in most cases, you know, we're, we're more or less on track and we can kind of, um, set our dates. Um, I like to make sure that there's only one baby in there. You know, it's good to know if you've got multiple gestations. I've had a couple of really funny, I had one, um, patient who came in and, and I, I found twins and I said oh wow there's twins and she just hauled off and punched me in the shoulder oh man and I was like <laughs> whoa so after that I was a little bit gun shy you yeah. know and so I uh, two three times later I said I see twins and I'm kind of like inching away from yeah make sure you're not within striking distance and, yeah. uh, and she was very appropriate and she says oh wow that's a uh, that's 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 interesting, you know, and asking appropriate questions. And I hear in the background this thump, and the dad had just like toppled like a red tree. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, always fun to know, and always important to know whether there's just one or, or more than one. Um, so we try to identify the viable viability of the pregnancy. We also want to make sure it's in the right place. Occasionally, sure. you run into ectopic pregnancies. Um, and those are important things to know. And then, and then last but not least, we want to ensure that our dates are right on. So once we've got that all established, we send them for labs. The labs usually entail um, blood type. So we want to know um, blood compatibility and whether or not we're going to need to do something later to protect pregnancies or future pregnancies. So there's a, a thing for uh, called Rogam that we get people that have Rh negative blood, um, and that's that's a, a thing that we just need to know pretty early on. We want to make sure people have been immunized um, against rubella. Mm -hmm. Rubella is a, a thing that can cause birth defects and, and problems. Um, we check for basic infections that can cause problems. Um, some of those are state mandated. Mandated, um, like syphilis. We don't rare, rarely ever see syphilis. I've never seen it in, in this county. But um, not to say that people might not travel through, but generally speaking, it's not too common. Sure. But, um, but other infections, um, gonorrhea, uh, chlamydia might be. Um, we check in our office, we check herpes, we check thyroid studies. Um, people are off on their thyroid that can affect pregnancy. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and there's a, I'm probably missing one or two. Those are, those are some of the basic labs that we check. Absolutely. Um, we, in my case, I usually wait until the next visit to do the exam uh, where we do cultures. Um, generally speaking, I do that because um, I don't put people through all of that until I'm pretty sure about the viability of the pregnancy. Sure. Um, and what the, it's a sort of a different pathway that I would follow. Uh, some people do that exam at the first visit, and there's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with that. Yeah. Um, it, it's fairly standard across the country. Most people do pregnancy in a very similar way. Uh, through the first 28 weeks, the template that most people follow is every four weeks they'll have people come in for a visit. Sure. Then they'll go to every two weeks, and progressively at about 36 weeks, they'll go to every week. Mm -hmm. We change it all the time. Uh, we change it uh, basically to cover whatever it is that people might need. Some pregnancies are, are more needy than others, you know, for, mm -hmm. for all kinds of medical reasons. Um, but that's sort of the basic. Um, so it, interestingly, usually I'll see people about 12 or 13 times before they deliver their baby. Mm -hmm. um, and then we, we see them at the delivery. And then usually once or twice, depending, um, after the delivery in that first six to eight weeks after. Sure. Uh, we'll talk uh, visits uh, after the delivery here in a second. Again, we're joined by Dr. Eric Seward with Woodlawn Hospital. You talked about some of the prenatal care. Uh, for someone who maybe it's their first time getting pregnant, what advice do you have for them? What are some big pieces of advice for uh, for the couple in terms of maybe exercise, maybe diet, anything like that to ensure that uh, their baby will be born healthy? Sure. Um, well, uh, the biggest thing would be um, make sure that you get rid of all of the, the super bad habits that, that you might have. So we want all the you know people that are on heroin and cocaine to stop that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it would be ideal if you could you know stop smoking. It would be ideal if you didn't use alcohol in the buildup. Now, that said, uh, a lot of people come in. This is a, a, a funny and common question I get. And they'll come in and they'll say, ah, you know, I was at this party drinking the, the night I got pregnant or something. And I'm like, I think 
a lot of pregnancies happen that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that said, um, you know, ideally, the minute that you find out that you're pregnant, you want to avoid certain exposures. And, and there's, there's a... There's a category system for medicines. If people are on medicines that have higher categories, and they're they're categorized A's, B's, C's, D's, and X's. D's and X's are not ideal for pregnancy. X's are sort of considered like I, I don't do that, mm-hmm. um, and they they're like chemotherapy and and uh, and there's a few like Rogaine is one that grows hair on, on guys' heads, and but it's got um, problems with pregnancy. Um, there's one of the uh, Accutane is one of the uh, medicines people use for acne. Um, and that can cause problems if people are on, uh, if women in particular are on testosterone supplements or exposed to them, that can cause problems. Mm-hmm. Um, so there, there is a handful of these X's that are bad, and then these are have known birth defects, but they might be necessary for for people. Um, a, a good example of that might be a seizure medicine. Somebody might have to be on them, but they they are associated with birth defects, and so we want to monitor those things closely. Sure. Um, if somebody happens to have a medical problem like diabetes, we would want that to be under good control. Mm-hmm. Um, anything that's good for you um, in general health terms is probably even better for you when you're pregnant. So uh, things like exercise um, are good to continue, and it's good to be in, you know, fight and shape. I always think a pregnancy is a fairly athletic event. Yeah. Um, the closest, I've, I've never personally had a baby. Um, I've witnessed a lot of them, but um, the, the way women look after they've had a baby was uh, how I felt. I don't know how I looked after I ran marathons. <laughs> yeah. And so it seems like that kind of mega effort, you know, it... it it tends to take you know hours and sometimes even days yeah. through that labor process, and so it's just a very hard thing physically to do. Yeah. And so you want people to come in, uh, you know, in reasonable shape, able yeah. to handle that. Now, there's a lot of subplots to that. The human body's pretty amazing, um, mm-hmm. and with that in mind, though, to, to get to that question, though, anything that you can do to kind of get yourself in the the best state that you were in, mm-hmm. um, you know, if there's any problems with periods, if there's any specific health problems, it's always nice to uh, talk to a, a, a doctor about that um, or or just go online and address it the best sure. you can. Um, it's good to be on vitamins. Uh, the main thing that you get out of a prenatal vitamin um, that's helpful early on would be um, folic acid, which helps prevent neural tube defects. Um, that's, that's a good supplement to have. Um, looking at diets in general, it's always good to be on a just a, a, a good diet. Um, there's no real problem with caffeine and getting pregnant. Um, in fact, it might even help a little if a, a guy's on caffeine because it makes sperm swim a little faster. But uh, but that said, um, a lot of people like tailor back on their caffeine or stop at cold turkey when they get pregnant, and that causes problems, uh, you know, migraine headaches and things in a lot of my patients. And I'll see people that'll come in and they'll have added, you know, they'll have the normal pregnancy issues, but then the added issues from like mm-hmm. sudden withdrawals from from caffeine. So. Final thought here on the exercise and diet. We hear a common phrase: uh, "She's eating for two. Uh, so, uh, and, and you give a chuckle about that. What, uh, how, how do we feel about that uh, in terms of how much we should be eating? Should we should we be adding a little extra portions to the plate? Or, or we are we feel? are really um, getting into Thanksgiving talk because <laughs> I'm going to eat for three on. Yeah, on I want now. an excuse for me. <laughs> That's what I'm looking for. I saw a funny meme. It went it went something like, "It's great to be eating for two on Thanksgiving." giving um, <laughs> yes. as a pregnancy thing. Absolutely. But no, the truth of the matter is you don't need to eat for two. Um, and in fact, in the first trimester, a lot of times people um, can't hardly eat for one because of morning sickness. And um, morning sickness is a misnomer, as, as most pregnant women know. It's usually a combination of all-day sickness and weird sickness and food aversions and odd smell things. But when when you're eating you should you should set up a healthy diet for one you shouldn't necessarily skimp it's probably not the best idea to to diet through uh, the first part of pregnancy um, you know you want to get your nutrients you want to get the the you know wide variety of foods um, you don't want to necessarily skimp now I wouldn't um, ever you know and this is tricky as a doctor I can say hey you know we should watch 
weight gain, weight loss, things like that in pregnancy. And, and by far and away, the biggest problem we run into would be too much weight gain through the course of pregnancy. And what that usually ultimately does is it makes people um, have to work extra hard when they're done with their pregnancy in order to get back into fighting form. Um, it is a place where, if you think about it, your metabolic needs go up a little bit, but typically your exercise output and and those sorts of things go down through the course of pregnancy. It's just harder. It's harder to you know to do the same things at the same intensity um, as you get into the middle and late part of pregnancy. Plus, you have these just sort of weird things happening internally that that affect a lot of of. You know, just how you normally function. So, one of the things that, and and I would be quick to encourage all the prospective dads out there, is I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I, I would be kind and gentle in how you approach that topic, yes. um, because there is, you know, a lot of potential for a back slap in your <laughs> face. Yeah, so you just want to be careful. <laughs> the yeah. the um, the bottom line is that most of the time uh most of my at least first time pregnant moms don't gain much weight through the first half of their pregnancy um it's a little different with second third and fourth moms but and then then they gain pretty steadily after that by the end of pregnancy you're going to grow a eight pound thing plus a two three pound placenta plus um you know probably two gallons of fluid floating around in your system which which amounts to about 25 to 30 pounds um if a person is thin and, and in you know good good shape when they come into pregnancy um they could probably they could probably gain five or ten extra pounds and not it wouldn't hurt things too much um if somebody comes in and their body mass index is 35 and they're they're overweight, then generally we want to kind of keep it at the low end of the weight gain, maybe 10 or 15 pounds for the whole pregnancy. So you can actually use, um, Weight Watchers doesn't um, propose a pregnancy uh, specific plan. I think, and you find this is generally true with all commercial anything. Uh, nobody wants to mess with pregnant women. But um, but they do have suggestions. And the truth of the matter is that you can you can modify a diet plan to not gain weight and be pregnant. Um, now, I have found that it's awfully hard to, to mandate a diet on somebody who's pregnant just because certain things don't sound good and other things do. And, and you get into that whole, how do you balance out health and most of the time some of those cravings are telling you something uh, so if you listen if it's a salty thing or a you know, vitamin e thing or a calcium thing um it, it, you know those may be the the, the craveable foods mm-hmm. um but yeah i think uh no eat for one except for on thanksgiving yeah. eat as much as you want <laughs> and, yeah and uh and try to you know kind of keep a reasonable diet reasonable activity um if people aren't exercisers i would say get out and walk um, you know, try to get the blood pump in a little bit. If you are an exerciser, stick with the plan that you've been on and modify it as you need to. I would go less off of performance. So when we get like the high intensity folks, a lot of times they're all upset because they're not able to run the same pace or their 5k times are, are, are slower or something. And yeah, it happens. Um, it's better to like go off of heart rate and time. And sure. so if you, you know, and you'll find that you'll get less miles but um but more uh the same heart rate and the same time will will give you the same physiological effect sure absolutely yeah uh dr stewart before we let you go we want to talk a little bit about um the child has been born let's talk about the visits that come after the birth what are we looking for there well um you know once once we deliver that baby um then it's sort of a tag team. Uh, I, I like to think of myself as a you know pro wrestler at that point, and I tag my uh, partner in. And my partner, in this case, is going to be the, the pediatrician or the pediatric specialist. Sometimes they may be family practice doctors in, in this community. Um, and they're going to set up a, a follow-up schedule based on a, a number of things. Usually, it's going to be based on when the first shots are due. Um, and they usually want to check in with the babies in, in about a week to two weeks. And then there's a, a shot schedule. It's usually, um, you know, the, and they can go over that because it changes a lot. But uh, usually there's a few visits in the first uh, couple of months, and then it kind of spaces out um, until you get, I think, at the six-month point, then the next one might be a year. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, that's very modifiable, just kind of like my, my OB 
part of that is very modifiable because babies sometimes are born with, you know, low or high sugars or bilirubin issues or um, they may be watching growth. Um, I know our pediatricians are very aggressive about when you've got like a real young mom, you know, maybe a 15 or 16 year old is going to have more challenges than the 28 year old who's having her third baby. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and so they, and, and of course there's, while it'd be, it'd be lovely if everybody was perfectly healthy and had no bad habits, um, you know, we do have to deal with the unhealthy and the bad habits. And so a lot of times that those things continue to take, um, you know, a lot of time, even in my office, I'm following up more with people that have diabetes or have um, some other med- high blood pressure, things like that. And, and the pediatricians are going to be doing the same thing with sicker babies. Um, so that all is, is sort of established usually before moms go home from the hospital. We've got our first visit or two set up, and then um, ultimately we go from there. Um, and then, you know, we've got some wonderful pediatricians and wonderful um, primary care folks in the community. So whoever it is that ultimately people decide to go see or whoever it is that ultimately delivers your baby, um, that that handoff or that tag team um, approach is pretty pretty solid here in, in, in Rochester, Indiana. Absolutely. Dr. Eric Seward with Woodlawn Hospital joins us this morning on Giant FM WROI. Dr. Seward, thanks so much for stopping by. Thank you.